happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys hey gang welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason berlindi the founder of the fretboard journal magazine and thank you so much for tuning in these are crazy times i don't think any of us really know what to expect around the corner we're all hunkered down washing hands like crazy coronavirus is all on our minds And uh, I just want to give a reminder out there that there are so many amazing musicians out there right now who are out of work, so many amazing luthiers who can't show their guitars at shows, who desperately would love to sell you one of their guitars to uh, just keep your eyes, keep your eyes open. There's a lot of amazing, cool stuff out there that uh, you should check out, if for no other reason than to kill time. And on that note, I decided to start a informal, virtual little guitar festival that we are calling FJ Fest, hashtag FJ Fest. This is a place where on our website and our social media channels, we're going to be sharing some of the cool instruments that our friends have available. We're also going to be sharing some instructors who would love to give you an amazing Skype instruction lesson right now. And a lot more. If any luthiers are out there listening to this, grab your iPhone, put it on video mode. Give us a little shop tour of of the stuff you're working on. Take a little video. Send it to me at festival at fretboardjournal.com. We will share it. If anybody out there has any live streaming concerts with a tip jar or anything, hashtag it, FJFest. We'll try to share it if we can. Uh, This is going to require a collective effort to get our little community's economy back on track. I know there's a lot to be determined. I know the world feels like it's falling apart, but I know we also will support each other. On that note, I don't want any advertising money from any of these luthiers who are desperate to sell a guitar or any of you uh, musicians out there who had to cancel a tour. But I will say if anybody wants to support what we are all about Get, get a digital subscription to the Fretboard Journal magazine. It's 30 bucks, and you'll not only get the next four issues we put out, but the last two. And uh, I can tell you right now, those last two issues had some incredible content, probably around uh, 300 pages of uh, media editorial that you can dive into right now while you're sitting at home. And you can look at them on your laptop or your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you have, and you'll be supporting what we are about because... All the stores, all the guitar stores are, uh, I think, temporarily closed. Uh, All of the uh, festivals have been postponed. All the things where people would normally see a magazine like ours, I think, are going to be affected in a big way. And we are here in Seattle where I feel like we're a few days ahead of the curve. So I hope you will support us and also look for that hashtag FJFest. It starts on Friday. We have a concert with Al Petaway. Thanks to Dream Guitars, we'll be sharing and a lot more. Friday, again, March 20th is when all the fun happens. Today on the podcast, I'm talking to Peter Henriksen, another guy who's got a guitar festival, the Rocky Mountain Archtop Festival, but most importantly, he's the guy behind Henriksen Amplifiers, the amazing line of amplifiers that, until recently, were mainly for, I think, jazz guitar players, but now have really branched out, so all sorts of players, acoustic and electric open micers and people in bands have been turning to Henriksen amps. He is up to a lot of cool stuff. So I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, we have, of course, a couple of other podcasts you should check out. Luthier on Luthier. We also have a new Truth About Vintage Amps podcast posting this week. And uh, if you are thoroughly not sick of my voice, I went. I had an epic conversation with my friend Mike Squires on his Couch Riffs podcast. So check that out. In other news, like I said, support us if you can. Get a digital subscription to the Fretboard Journal. Issue 46 is just around the corner. Our electric annual, despite some hiccups and now some slowdowns because of staffing at our printer, will be coming out in about 10 days. So uh, everybody who pre-ordered that, 
uh, thank you. You'll be getting that, I promise you. And then, of course, if you haven't ordered that, you can on our website. Uh, that's separate from a regular subscription just because we know a lot of our readers do not want an electric guitar magazine. They want the Fripboard Journal that they've known and loved since David Grisman and Tony Rice were on the cover. So it's an add-on for those of you who uh, want to get adventurous and take a journey with us down that little rabbit hole. Uh, you can find all that via the show notes. All right, here is my talk with Henriksen. I hope you enjoy it. Peter, thanks for talking to me. I see you at all the guitar shows now, and I'm seeing you more and more online. But for folks maybe who don't know about Henriksen Amps, give us a brief uh, history. Sure, no problem, Jason. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, brief history of Henriksen Amplifiers. Uh, it's, it all started with my dad. He kind of it, it got retired as he could get and decided to start playing uh, guitar a little bit more and couldn't find an amplifier that he liked. So he built one, uh, had enough people ask him about, you know, the prototype and thought it sounded really good that he decided to build 10 of them, sent those around and enough people like that, that he, uh, he called me and asked if I wanted to go into business with him building guitar amplifiers. And, uh, that was 2006. We shipped our first one. Wow! And what was that first amp like? Um, it was uh, as far as I know, it's still out there. So uh, we still are in contact with our very first customer. Um, so it was a uh, single channel, single ten inch combo. We just called the jazz amp that's all we sure. <laughs> didn't have a model number or anything and uh uh no reverb it was just volume and a five band eq i think that was the feature set now your dad obviously had some sort of electronics or engineering background to just whip that out it wasn't like a fender clone uh, yeah no 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 he uh during the uh, late seventies, all the way up through the early nineties, he owned a company of the Henriksen data systems and they manufactured everything, you know, starting out with, I think, telex connectors to some telephony equipment up to, uh, like PBX phone switching systems. So he had quite a background in running, uh, electronics manufacturing. And in fact, when we got back into doing, um, uh, the, we got into doing the guitar amplifiers. A lot of our old accounts were still open, like our Mauser account and uh, <laughs> DigiKey <laughs> from way, way back. Nice. Would uh, did did you already have an electronics background too when you joined him? Well, I, I I grew up. That was my summer job. Instead of mowing lawns, I was stripping wires and soldering circuit boards, and um, you know, I uh, knew my way around. Um, a test bench uh but uh, my my background uh was i was doing software at the time so um i did not i knew just enough about electronics to be a little bit dangerous but uh that was much more my dad's uh, background got it now you guys obviously have a uh a varied uh roster of amplifiers but i'm curious uh, give give folks out there you know we do this vintage amps podcast i co-host and we t we tend to talk you know in the fretboard journal more about that stuff but what makes a great jazz guitar amplifier in your mind it's mostly about being a full spectrum kind of response to the guitar i think with jazz guitar you definitely want a you know uh, a more piano like response whereas the the scooped kind of uh, approach to a rock and roll amp is more appropriate to get rid of some muddiness um, to, for that style of playing. So I think that's, that's kind of where the differences start is that you want high, high, clean headroom and good mid range response for jazz uh, and acoustic versus um, a little more breakup headroom and a scoop response for uh, you know, more mainstream styles of guitar. And obviously overdrive, you don't want overdrive, but I'm curious, uh, acoustic, eh, some, arch, you know, <laughs> sometimes you do. Yeah. Every, everything's kind of a crossover these days. There's not a lot of people doing, sh 
uh, well, there's plenty of people doing it, but, but, uh, crossover approaches to tones and, uh, styles are, uh, are more mainstream than, you know, mainstream itself. Sure. And in your estimation, uh, you, you don't want to work with tubes for what you're doing, or is that more of a weight factor? Uh, a lot of it's the weight factor, uh, but it's also, uh, for jazz guitar, the difficulty with tube amps is the sweet spot. And, you know, being able to play them uh, clean, uh, you know, uh, a tube, an all-tube amplifier with enough headroom to play clean at loud volumes is a little inconvenient to drag to, you know, a jazz trio sure. gig up three flights of stairs in a wine bar. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, that that's probably the, the primary issue. Yeah. And, um, when you say, you know, trying to bring out the sound of a acoustic or not an acoustic, but, a of an arch top guitar, when you play an arch top acoustically, a lot of them, you know, there's not a lot of sound there. Uh, I'm just curious, do you want Henriksen amps to be completely neutral or do, is there like a, a tone range you're going for? Do you want to color anything at all? Well, every amplifier by its nature is going to have some coloration, but our approach has always been to interfere with the signal as little as possible mm -hmm. and just let the natural sound of, uh, the pickup as the pickup designer intended in conjunction with how the guitar vibrates and the strings interplay with that uh and just make the truest sound out of the guitar as you know as loud as the person wants to hear it sure. um our amplifiers you know along that line our amplifiers don't have traditional tone controls they just have uh, an equalizer so you can kind of dial in and eliminate the pick noise if you need to or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's much it's much more about adjusting the amplifier to the room. Yeah. So if you're getting, you know, some boomy reflections or or conversely if something's eating a certain signal uh frequency range, you can boost that. Uh but the tone coming from the guitar and from your hands is just what we make louder. Yeah. You know, we want to make our amplifier as, you know, as transparent as possible, but without that, uh, you know, high by sterility that you get with uh, some solid state amplifiers. Now, as with uh, as with tube amps, are there some guitars that play better than others with your amps or it's not really a factor? Did you say some guitars? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. A, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on who you ask and who's <laughs> listening, but, <laughs> um, you know, for our amplifiers, humbuckers are easy plug and play. Um, basically, uh, th they all sound the way, like I said, like the pickup designer intended them to sound. Um, there isn't any real pickup that doesn't really work with our amps. Uh, with the exception of say like older, older style floating pickups, those are just difficult to amplify regardless. But, um, uh, I think that's true across, you know, all manufacturers of amplifiers, the older floating pickups are problematic. Sure. You know, much like, like with acoustic stuff, the older school transducers are difficult to amplify as well. New stuff is, uh, it's made so well. There's been a lot of advancements. Pretty much everything sounds good. Sure. Were you a jazz player before you took this gig on? No. Uh, <laughs> Are you now? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I try. Uh, I'm many, many years of hours a day of practice away from being a, a, a real guitar player, uh, certainly for jazz. But I grew up playing music and appreciating it for sure. Jazz guitar was my dad's passion that I sort of inherited along with the company. And uh, as an appreciator of the music, it's been wonderful, but also, you know, I feel like I get to meet the best people in this genre uh, 
it takes a lifetime to master. Uh, you know, people are still learning lessons in their seventies uh, enthusiastically. It's not yeah. something you can pick up and be great at a few years. It's a it's a lifetime pursuit, and I like being around people who who understand that and uh, who dedicate their lives to it. Yeah. Now you've you've obviously with some of your amps like the blue you've addressed the weight and size factor and you've got Bluetooth now and some amps. What what are some of the requests that you continuously get that you may or may not ever address from jazz players in terms of what they want? I think we've got the jazz player pretty well uh, uh, accommodated. Um, the only thing that we get requests for. Uh, as a practical matter that I don't think we'll be doing anytime soon as a battery powered amp um, for a lot of reasons. But number one, there's a big regulatory headache with manufacturing things with big batteries. And then uh, I'd much rather just recommend there are some uh, inverter battery pack type of solutions out there in the photography world that if you ground them right, you can get a five, six hour gig out of one of our amplifiers yeah yeah cool and and i i'm curious with you know i'm looking over your lineup there's some pretty small speakers in some of your your amps the blue's got like a six and a half inch speaker um are there trade-offs there or are speakers so good now that you can get that full range jazz sound with tiny speakers there have been some serious advancements in uh, in speaker manufacturing, just maybe in terms of the quality. Uh, there, um, I don't think you can get as much sound out of a small box as we'd get without the specific speakers that are in there, and they weren't, you know, they haven't been made the way they've been made for that long. Uh, fundamentally a speaker hasn't changed very much, but I, I think it's the quality of manufacture and the advancements in that that are really pushing the limits um, and the demand for line array systems, making things smaller and smaller. Got it. Are you working with those speaker manufacturers directly and kind of giving them feedback? Yeah. On what? We, yeah. yeah. We've always stocked uh, imminent speakers in our amplifiers. Um, sometimes off the shelf, but a lot of OEM stuff because they, uh, you know, they make the best speakers for, for what we do. Yeah. And now obviously, you know, it's I've been mentioned the word jazz a thousand times, but you've got guys using <laughs> the bud and a bunch of these for just open mics or any acoustic guitar, right? Yeah. Well, the bud really changed everything for us. Um, the, uh, the name, uh, Bud was my dad's name, and uh, so that's it. It kind of came about because of the way the amplifier came about. I was clearing out a box of his stuff after moving it a few times, and there was a tiny box with the six-inch speaker in it, and it happened to be the same size as one of the power boards for our, the new heads that we were putting out. And I had a slow day, so I thought, well, let's see how small of an amplifier we can build out of this, and. Uh, put it on my desk, took a picture of it, put it on Facebook. And the response was pretty big. Like, Hey, I'd like to try that. And so I wanted to build just a small jazz amp. And, uh, we had my friend Sean McGowan come over and <clears throat> I told him, I'm like, listen, thinking about putting this into production, but I don't want to do this unless it's really gigable. Like you can be a professional and buy this from me and do gigs with it. So he said, okay, Brought every single guitar he owned, which was like a, a lot. Sean had a lot of guitars. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the last one we went through was uh, his uh, his flat top with a K and K in it, and it sounded so good. We couldn't believe how much how great the acoustic guitar sounded and how much sound was coming out of it. Um, we uh, we, we were shocked. And so, uh, talked it over with, uh, Nate, our vice president and engineer. And he said, basically, well, there's, you know, good news and bad news. The good news is, yeah, this is going to be a great acoustic guitar amp. The bad news is now we need phantom powered inputs and two channels and input gains and all of this <laughs> other stuff. 
and uh, uh, it sort of it just started to snowball from there. And by the time we put it out, uh, it's it's it really I, you know I don't say this as a sales pitch. You really can throw anything at these, and they sound great. So because they're 120 watts, even though they're so small, you can do the singer songwriter thing with them and not have to drag a PA with you. And that's been a lifesaver for a lot of people Um, or duet gigs, you know, or trading off between, you know, you got a Telecaster in one channel and an acoustic guitar in the other channel. And uh, it's not really aimed at a specific genre or style like the jazz amp was. It really is, uh, you know, a, a useful Swiss army knife. <laughs> yeah. What is the R and you kind of mentioned it, but what's the R and D process for something like that? You, you find the speaker and your dad's belongings. Uh, I mean, how many iterations before the finished product? I know you said you wanted, you know, phantom power was needed and a bunch of other doodads, but is it all on you? Are you there with like a soldering iron making this all happen? Uh, I was, and right before the bud sort of came about is when I um, I hired Nate Mender just to work one day a week uh, to help me do some repairs. And uh, he's turned himself into quite the engineer and uh, is uh, responsible for, you know, taking all these ideas and turning them into a reality. Got it. How, how big of a company is it right now? How many employees do you have? Uh, there's five of us. Okay. It's amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. In five short years, Facebook keeps showing me those, you know, those Facebook memories and, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the summer NAM show of 2015 was our first real, it was my first time exhibiting at a NAM show since 2010, because with, when my dad died and the economy collapsed, I just kind of, uh, you know, quit going to the NAM show. Mm-hmm. So with the bud, we thought, okay, well, there's a reason for us to be back out there and there's a reason for us to reach out and, you know, find more people than just the straight ahead jazz guitarist because this thing works so well for everything. And, uh, so we've committed ourselves to that and doing a bunch of guitar shows and, um, you know, advertising more and just talking to more people. And, uh, it just turns out, uh, you know, our product line is really geared towards everybody. Uh, it is what it is. It's not an old tube amp. Um, there are plenty of those, but it does take pedals extremely well. And uh, it's a great recording interface for, you know, if you use the line out, it's really clean. We get a lot of people that send us albums they used it for. Yeah. And Got the uh, headphone here jack. we are. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. totally. Uh, I mean, the world of jazz you know amplifiers has been such a an odd limiting one there were polytones back in the day and all that stuff but uh you you guys have captured a piece of the market that was really not being addressed very well well i think with the the demise of polytone uh over the course of time by the by the time my dad started picking up the guitar again and looking for an amplifier he tried to buy a few of them but the company was in such bad shape they weren't putting out very good product and it was impossible to find one and that was 2005 but they certainly you know as a uh as a company they certainly paved the way for small portable solid state you know sounds good with the jazz guitar kind of thing but what we've found is by uh by putting out something that's that you know neutral i don't want to imply bland but that that neutral and accepting of whatever input you put in it. Um, that's great. And it's ideal for jazz guitar, but it also makes it great for so many other things. Um, jazz guitar has always been just plug and play. Um, uh, you know, uh, traditional straight ahead stuff, but, uh, the ability to be very articulate, uh, there's very little compression on these amplifiers, um, unlike with tube amps, you get, uh, compression, a good sounding compression, but it's still some compression and the, the dynamics you can create with one of our amplifiers is just goes from, you know, the sound of breathing to, you know, back in your chair loud. Neat. What, what would be if, uh, you know, we've talked about portability 
and small speakers and and uh, some of the things that a, a gigging musician who's traveling and, and playing at cafes or wherever might need. But for those guys out there, and I know they're listening to this podcast, they've got a Ken Parker or a Mona Leone or a Benedetto that never leaves the house. Like, what is the ultimate jazz amplifier? Like, size no object, weight no object. It's not going anywhere. What would you What would you gravitate towards? Uh, man, that's a really tough thing because... I have heard some really incredible sound systems that the key is weight and a lot of it so that mm-hmm. you perfectly baffle the speaker. And, you know, I think ideally the perfect speaker cabinet is like 10,000 pounds made of steel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what, that's what Wi-Fi audio people tell me. Um, uh, I, you know, I think ideally you'd want five or six different amplifiers to plug uh, you know, every, uh, every guitar sounds, uh, different and has quality attributes. And I, I don't, I don't think there is an ideal with amplifiers. Yeah. Um, and it, for some people, they want a larger speaker, uh, for, oh, you know, for hollow body guitars, that can be a feedback issue. Um, one of the nice things about our smaller speaker units is it's it's sort of naturally feedback resistant. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Sure. What what is uh what's your test guitar? Um, our test guitar is an Eastman. Um, I don't remember the model number. Uh, with apologies to Eastman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it used to be uh, an Eastman El Rey um, signed by our friend Otto D'Ambrosio. And it was a guitar that I traded an amplifier for because mine were kind of getting too sentimental value to leave as shop guitars. And so um, uh, I, on this forum, a guy had one for sale and I just emailed him like, Hey, would you trade an amp for that? Cause I need a good shop guitar. And it was perfect except it was a shop guitar. And so over the years it had fallen over a few times and taken quite a bit of abuse. And uh, a friend of mine who works for Eastman was at the shop and he, he saw the, the atrocity that that guitar had become. <laughs> so many a luthier had, has attempted to bring it back to life. <laughs> he said, like, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get this taken care of for you. So they've, they've loaned us a guitar that, um, it's their uh, two pickup um, L5 size cutaway guitar, and I, I apologize, I can't remember the the model number, but it's uh, it, it as advertised, it's been indestructible. It it <laughs> lives in a warehouse with two uh, two natural gas space heaters in it. It's in Colorado. The humidity gets down to twelve percent, and the thing's great. No cracks. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's been great. Uh, very indestructible. So that's the shop. That's the shop guitar. <laughs> yeah, twelve percent humidity. Are you having to worry about wood issues the way a luthier would for the cabinets? No, no, okay. because they are uh, not really. They, they stay in their packaging until we stuff them and put them back in the packaging. So we don't run our own cabinet shop. Um, like most, you know, most amp companies don't because it's a huge investment in equipment and time and labor. And so when we get the cabinets from the manufacturer, they come in, um, you know, retail ready packaging for us. So when we pull them out, they've been sealed. Uh, so they're not really, they're, they're not as subject to the drying as if you had, you know, open racks of wood laying out. Okay. Huh. Who knew? Amazing. And they're either plywood. We're not dealing with, uh, um, you know, we're not dealing with hardwoods or tone woods or anything like that in a in a speaker cabinet. It's it's plywood, so uh, hasn't been an issue. And are you guys working on any uh, new amps now that you probably can't talk about, or are you pretty happy with the lineup? <laughs> Uh, really happy with the lineup. We just launched the head version of the Bud, so that's the ultimate traveler. It's three and a half pounds. Um, it does everything for you. It's 120 watt amp, so it's uh, it's a tiny head. It's an acoustic DI. It's a recording. It's 
it does everything. So those are just shipping now. We kind of launched them at NAM, and then uh, we've got some developments. We do have an amp that's uh, a tube amp preamp. Uh, it's hmm. a hybrid, and that's been uh, working on um, another uh, another addition to that line. Uh, that's called the Forte, and it's a 12AX7 preamp-based um, tube stage post our regular five-band EQ. And uh, man, it's uh, it's it's a fun amp. It's it's not quite as uh, plug-and-play intuitive because there's so many controls going on, mm -hmm. but it, you can really dial in whatever you want with it. And it's ridiculously loud. <laughs> yeah, and and obviously the merits, uh, you, you know, you you accept that tube amps or tube preamps at least have some merits that can't be achieved oh, in yeah, solid yeah. state. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, I think the ideal is for everybody to have four or five amps. They're all different. They have different tools for different jobs. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, what spawned the development of the Forte was, like we were talking about earlier, with the absence of polytone, we were kind of you know, there's that solid state sound, but then there's that Fender Twin, Fender Deluxe sound. And they're kind of apples and oranges when it comes to jazz in our background. Um, so we wanted something for, you know, people who want to play with that, you know, that tube sound and feel. Uh, and we didn't have that. So without going into building all tube amplifiers, because that's a whole different business that I didn't want to get into. Mm -hmm. um, this hybrid made a lot of sense. It made really good use of our, uh, the class AB power uh, design that we've been using. And it just sounded so good when, you know, again, Nate took, uh, he took one of his amps and just wired in the preamp in conjunction with the jazz amp. And it was, it just, it just worked, you know, sometimes with, with audio electronics, you know, they're like recipes. Some things work, some things don't, uh, regardless of what the theory is, but this just works. Yeah. Nice. Do you have a whole like library of classic amps to reference or to go back to, or maybe take apart? I used to, uh, it was, it was the pile of amplifiers my dad went through when he was trying to find something he liked. And uh -huh. there were uh, it this great condition uh, Gibson GA30 oh, nice. that I, I really liked until it sort of hit this level of entropy where I got tired of paying to have it fixed. And I sold it to somebody who modded it beyond recognition and he really likes it, <laughs> but it was no longer collectible or even recognizable. Uh, we had a GA 75, I think is the model number. Uh -huh. It had a gigantic 15 inch speaker in it and four channels. And uh, that sounded great when it worked again that was a 50s era i think 50s era gibson and uh you know when they're great they're great yeah uh we've got our bench engineer um does a lot of repair work on the side for other people and he's kind of a princeton expert and there's always at least three or four princetons he's working on in the shop uh there's a broken down jc120 in there somewhere um you know that's more of a junkyard thing than a reference amp. but so yeah we have we're like everybody else we have tons of other amplifiers laying around you yeah know. uh into guitars and the amps there's uh, a you mentioning that they constantly need work there's a reason why that truth about vintage amps podcast we do is one of our most successful endeavors because <laughs> everyone's having some issues <laughs> at one point or another uh oh yeah 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 just to change gears yeah, that, yeah go ahead sure i was just gonna say you know when we when we first started this out there was a lot of the like what you couldn't really talk about amps without getting into the tube versus solid state discussion and i just don't feel like it's a versus kind of discussion i mean it's like do you you know we you're talking about the vintage stuff and it being worked on if you're going to relate it to cars it'd be like talking about you know uh a tesla versus an old muscle car it's sure. not the same it's not the same thing you know? yeah 
they're both cars, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, the I end result, as That's we true. often say on that podcast, is like, are you making good music or not? <laughs> like, yeah, it doesn't exactly. matter. You know? Are you are you are, are you feeling it? Are you liking what you're here? And yeah. when we develop, you asked about our development process. It basically stops when we can't put it down. You know, we're we're done when we can't stop playing it. That's when it's time to put it to market. Uh, just to switch gears for a second, Colorado, not necessarily known as being a jazz hub. There's Johnny Smith and there's Bill Frizzell, those Colorado artists. You are quickly making it one with this Arch Chop Festival that you just created out of thin air. Talk to me about that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I'm creating a jazz scene. I might be exposing one that's already here. Um, yeah. Denver, Denver's kind of an island, you know, if, Last count, I think there's 2.8 million people in the metro drivable within an hour and a half area. But then there's nothing for like nine hours. So it's not like uh, much of the United States where in you know, you can cross state lines within an hour to drive. Um, sure. So there's, there's lots of people here. Um, you just don't hear about them because it's a pretty big endeavor to leave or you know, to come and go touring and whatnot. Uh, so we, we've got a lot of amazing players, but the reason that there's an Archtop Festival here is because there needed to be an Archtop Festival and nobody else was stupid enough to try to make it happen. <laughs> so <laughs> that leaves me. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it was great. I, the, we, like you said, we pulled it out of thin air. It, it came together in about four months. It was based on a three o'clock in the morning Facebook post um, I just, you know, we do a lot of these guitar shows where, uh, there, there aren't a lot of amplifier companies, if any other amplifier companies, um, sure. uh, my friend, Jerry Humphrey is, uh, Humphrey amps. He's at a few of them. Uh, so I, I, because they're mostly acoustic guitar shows and a lot of those builders don't install pickups unless they're by request. So they're pretty acoustic shows. So there's all, you know, the back of the room, there's me and, you know, a dozen or so people that just really build arch tops, which almost always have a pickup installed in them. And it's such a special instrument with such a crazy history and, uh, you know, broad application that most people, most people only associated with jazz, but there's so much more an arch top is that I felt like if we created a guitar show around that context, there were enough builders who also wanted to get that message out and certainly enough players that we could build a show around it. And so we did. Nice. And what, uh, it, it's happening again this year, right? It is September 11th, 12th, and 13th, same place. And it's happening in Arvada, Colorado, because that's where I live. Uh, <laughs> you got to make it sort of easy on yourself when you do these insurmountable things. Well, what's great about this festival is it happens in, uh, you know, I call it my little town. It's a uh, hundred years ago, this was its own self-contained farm town, but it's sort of been absorbed by the, the metropolitan Denver area. And it's got lots of venues, lots of, you know, tap rooms and wine bar and coffee shop kind of stuff. And there's a train that runs here straight from the airport and there's one hotel. So everything can kind of happen in this one little walkable space, um, you know, immune from, you know, larger events going on in a larger metropolitan areas, but not so far removed that you have to travel, uh, you know, way out in the boonies to attend it. Uh, it's just kind of a, it's a great spot for what it is. Yeah. And do you have a luthier showcase plus music festival because all of the sponsored artists of these luthiers are invited. And so we had, I, I want to say we had over 35 hours of music last year. Um, all free to the public because it's a product demo going on in a coffee shop becomes a one hour performance. Sure. Incredible. Who are some of the players coming this year and who are some of the luthiers? I don't have any confirmations I can really say publicly at this okay. moment. 
because uh, I haven't gotten back to our, my email responses. But it's most everybody from last year, uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, everybody said, yeah, I'm, I want to come back. I'm coming back. So I'll just say last year we had, uh, and hope to have again, uh, we had uh, Ken Parker and Linda Manzer and Tom Rebecca and, um, and, you know, so this amazing list of incredible luthiers um, and some companies like Eastman and um, Roger Sadowski was there. Uh, Benedetto Guitars was there. Uh, um, the, uh, I can't remember the, the whole list off the top of my head. No, it's like your wedding. I'm sure you can't remember any of the details <laughs> just that it happened. Yeah. Well, we had, we had 23, I think 24, we had a last minute cancellation. So yeah, we had 23 luthiers. And again, this was just four months notice. Like, Hey, you want to come to Colorado and do a quick, cheap guitar show? Let's do it. And it's just the, the town got behind me and said, yeah, that's great. What can we do? And so we have an arts and culture commission that helped me do some planning and some funding. And uh, honestly, it was just the players who we've had developed these relationships with over the years emailed me and said, Hey, I want to come. I want to be a part of it. And uh, we apologized for it being a, the worst paying gig of all time that you had to travel to <laughs> but <laughs> everybody, you know, everybody, everybody had a great time. So uh, more details will be coming uh, in the next few weeks uh, as we finalize some stuff, but yeah, it's September 11th, 12th and 13th. Uh, one thing for sure is that the week leading up to that, uh, Frank Vignola is doing a camp that by now is probably sold out. Uh, it was, a uh, uh, 30 ticket camp. And so they're doing that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then Frank's going to do uh, a headlining performance for the Archtop Festival on Friday night. Um, if you don't know Frank, he's, uh, he's, he's amazing. Us. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he did that just to kind of preface the festival he was already going to be at. That's really cool. Well, he, yeah, well, he actually, he was, uh, he was talking to my friend Sean about doing the, uh, the uh the camp and he wanted you know he was taking his camp on the road basically and wanted to do a denver stop i guess and sean said hey why don't you coincide it with this arch top festival and so we uh, got on the same page and so uh <laughs> it's going to be a pretty incredible week for uh for arch top guitars i bet and and uh I think I've said this probably to you before but I have to imagine the cool thing about an arch top festival is unlike some acoustic guitar flat top luthery festivals where everyone's kind of a finger style player and just kind of tries to find a quiet corner by themselves I imagine the jamming is off the charts at an arch top festival uh, it, it's pretty ridiculous uh, uh, there's there's a picture uh, somewhere somebody has, I saw it on Facebook. There's a picture of uh, Ted Ludwig and Jimmy Bruno playing a duet in this coffee shop that I go to every morning. And there's some girl like doing her homework, sitting right next to Jimmy Bruno. No idea who he is. Because <laughs> it, it's just an average every day, you know, Saturday for, for, uh, for people who didn't know the festival was going on. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, we assigned everybody a, uh, you know, a demo spot. And a lot of them said, you know, Hey, can I play with so-and-so? And we're, we're like, yeah, you know, you're the professional, you do whatever you want. And so a lot of impromptu trios, guitar trios broke out. Uh, there were people in the lobby of the hotel up all hours, just handing guitars back and forth here. Check this out. Try this. A lot of people from opposite coasts who'd never met in person got to play together for the first sure. time. Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people from different styles, some very straight ahead players and some very modern players, um, some finger style acoustic players who just happen to like playing on an arch top, uh, you know, versus a flat top. Uh, we had, uh, that, that's kind of what we want to focus this on is the versatility of the instrument. It's, you know, a lot like our amplifiers, they're very highly associated with jazz because that's where we come from, but that's, that's not the limit of, that's not by any means the limit of their usefulness. Sure. Yeah. 
Well, very cool. I I know I'm looking forward to coming. Oh, great, man. That's going to be so fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's above all else. The, uh, you know, the quest for the great hang, right? Of course. That's really what we're all looking for. Yeah. Exactly. Hopefully uh, virus free. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, the, I don't think we'll suffer the same fate as South by Southwest as I don't, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, not, not quite that large uh, totally. of an event, but, uh, yeah, but just, you know, I like the shows because you get to, you know, see and touch and play this guitar, but talk directly to the person who built it. And, you know, what, why is this bridge like this? Why is this, you know, why is this this way? Why is this nut this size? You know, that kind of stuff and really get into the guitar itself and, you know, play it and sort of feel what they're talking about. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Yeah, completely. I mean, this is, it's why the fretboard journal exists. So we can meet these characters that sometimes we can't meet in person, but if you can meet them in person, all the better. Exactly. Exactly. So, well, Peter, thank you so much for talking to me. This was great, and it was great to hear a little bit of the story behind these amps that I keep lusting after. So, <laughs> well, you know where to find me. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, and no, it, was, uh, it was great. It was great talking to you, too, Jason. I really appreciate the uh, the time. That's, of course, uh, I, I love talking about here. We love to as well, and uh, I'll see you in Colorado. All right, man. Thank you. 